Hey everybody, what's up? I am Joe Marcello, joined as always by my bandit brother, Mike Farah. Hey gang. Orrin Phillips can't be with us this week. Uh, however, if you're listening to us, that means you're listening to the Dollar Bin Bandit podcast. And that also means it's Wednesday and you're getting your stash of comics. And, uh, you know, if you can pull yourself away, hopefully you can listen to one of our episodes. This week, we're bringing you an, uh, an interview with someone who has kind of worked for everyone, really. Um, we're talking about our interview with Kelly Jones. Uh, Kelly has worked for Dark Horse, DC, Marvel. Now, he's provided artwork for characters such as Magneto, Superman, Batman, and most recently, he did artwork uh, for Swamp Thing in 2018. You know, this is another Orin solo joint. You guys, you Orin heads out there are going to be uh, through the roof for this one. So, um I am jealous because Kelly Jones is a particular favorite of mine, specifically for his Batman covers and his interiors, uh, where he really brought a sort of exaggerated horror element to the character and the look. Um, but he also uh, redesigned Dead Man, um, you know, in the 90s to make him a little bit more skeletal the way we see him uh, today rather than sort of a... I guess, white-faced uh, superhero. Um, and also did uh, a few issues of the Sandman. So again, part of that Sandman legacy. But let's get to it. Let's see what Oren had to uh, ask the uh, the man himself, Kelly Jones. So I want to start, um, you began over at Marvel. Yep. Uh, what was the learning tree like there? Or who took you under their wing, if anyone? Uh, Marvel had, at least in my experience at that time and this is 1982 around october of 82 i actually halloween okay. weekend i was hired and um i freely admitted i did not know how to do this mm -hmm. um i knew how to ink and if you were uh inking someone that's easy you know here's a page you got so much time so when they transitioned me to being a penciler which i had not offered myself as mm. uh, they had a great kind of teaching situation where they didn't want you to sweat the small stuff they didn't want you to sweat uh, a lot of it they just wanted you know they wanted production they figured they figured if they they i mean not in an arrogant way they figured if they hired you they knew what they were doing mm. and i was under ralph macchio who was a fabulous editor at that time really really good editor so when I would have personal reservations or 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 fear, uh, Ralph would go very Brooklyn Italian and say, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. So this is what you do. But what he would do is say, Kelly, one panel a page, make it great, get the rest done. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, just get that page done that day or as close to done as you can and by the end of the month you'll have a book and there were great ways to think so when you were drawing you wouldn't obsess on something you couldn't get right a perspective point or a figure you just get it done he said trust your inker your inker will fix you i'll get you an inker who will fix you because i had said ralph i've drawn but i haven't really drawn a completed page wise a handful you know, a couple of dozen maybe, and only then to show that I could ink. Um, he put me under Butch Geis, who was one of the greatest, to me, one of the great comic book pencilers ever. And Butch would call me up and walk me through it and hold my hand. Uh, I was a kid. I was like 19, 18, 19 when they hired me. Really that young? Yeah. And um, so at that point, I was with to me, absolute veterans. And um, I was steeped in late 60s, early 70s. I wasn't really of that time because uh, that's what I grew up with. Right. So I was trying to do that still. And that just happened to work for me. You know, I was trying to be an inker who could finish rather than a penciler. Mm -hmm. I still think of myself as an inker. Uh, an inker first. Um, 
And that's where I have the most fun doing it. Really? You know? Yeah, by far. By far. The, the inking is, well, that's what everyone sees. Right. And that's where I, I try to, uh, and I've only inked myself now for 20 years or so, but, uh, and longer. But what I do is I try to do just enough penciling so I can finish with the inking and draw a lot with the inking. And that's where I think the life is. It, for, for me, I'm not into, uh, I'll see some people's pencils are like very finished and all filled in and all that stuff and they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to have as little rendering as possible, just indicate where the light's coming from, just where the figures are, all that stuff. And then I do the rest with, the, with my tools. Gotcha. I'm curious though, because you say you started with that 60s, 70s style of drawing. Yep. But I mean, the incredible thing about your art is when I see it, I know it's, you, it's, I know it's yours. Like uh, <laughs> and what you just said is true because the guys I'm talking about 60s, 70s, you knew that too. Right. And, and for me, I was always told coming up that that was a positive. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted it to be, uh, Marvel was great. And, and I think, uh, what they did at that time was they said, good or bad, we want people to know it's you yeah. because that's where style comes from. And that's where, and what they were meant on the bigger sense is you'll start developing your own uh, ideas, mm -hmm. right? And, and um, they said, use enough reference to get a, a train ride or a plane ride, but the rest we want up to you. Mm -hmm. Figure it out on your own. And they were great little shorthand things to teach you how to use your head. The reason they did that was that helped you with deadlines far better than worrying about every little detail, right. you know? And they were about getting the books out on time. Yeah, hitting deadlines and stuff. And how that translates now is a lot of guys now can only do two or three issues in a row and they're done. And then they got to get someone else. Okay. And and I was told they fully expect you to do 12 issues a year, but they didn't want you to burn out. Okay. So if you did it this way, uh, they told me a great thing once, uh, if you have a page, maybe they told writers to do this, I don't know. They said, if you have a page and you're done in two hours that day, stop, you're done, go do something else. That makes sense. Cause you're gonna have pages that take you 12 hours, Right. you know? Uh, they, uh, I know that uh, a few times I remember them chastising certain writers, uh, Ralph would tell me, when they would have lots of characters per panel over a long period of time. And they said, break it up, do some close-ups, don't kill your artist. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned a lot from them on the blue collar uh, longshoreman style of comics, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, so when I went over to DC, um, I had, that was the, that was the thing on how to learn. It wasn't three point perspective and it wasn't uh, all this antinomical stuff by Bern Horgoth, Bern Horgoth. It was how to get a page done in your style, how to think of the inker, how to set him up. Well, since I was an inker already, um, that, that part was easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, how to translate a script to get the emotion out of it. Now, a lot of these things have changed. I don't even think they do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I had a pretty brass knuckles editor in Ralph Macchio. Right. You know, <laughs> he's a sweet guy, but he was tough. Yeah. And um, uh, he was one of those guys who would ask you a question like, why did you do that? You didn't know if it was a like, hey, why did you do that? That's great. Or why did you do that? It sucks. Right. Just why did you do that? So what it meant is you better have an answer. And you know what? It was scary, but I'm glad I went through it because when I got to DC and I started feeling confident in using my ideas first, because mm -hmm. that's what I found worked for me was the ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, I could explain it. They'd say, why did you, for example, make Dead Man this way? I could explain it. Why do you do this to Batman? Why did you change? Why do you do this with Sandman? These weird things with Sandman. I could explain it because I've been taught to do that. Um, have the answer and have a plan. And um, it made the artwork much more stronger 
foundation wise. And you couple that with be able, being able to do, you know, whatever 12 issues of pages are per year, you were in. Yeah. Well, it takes me to something you said, which is really interesting. It's something I like to ask people because confidence, it takes a while to get it in the business, it seems. Was there a point that you remember saying to yourself, I can do this, like I belong here and I could draw things my way and it's yeah. going to be successful? Yeah, it came when I was able to look at a book that made an editor happy and me very disappointed. Really? Yeah. And then at that point I said, okay, I know I could make this better. And rather than make one person happy, why not make everybody happy? But the way I saw it. And if they weren't happy, I'll go out that way because I'd rather enjoy myself drawing it. Mm. Everyone hate it. Then I can go on and be a bricklayer um, because I'll be miserable. Right. So when that happened, it was... Uh, it, the irony at Marvel was I started as an inker, became a penciler, and then they wouldn't let me ink myself. Okay. Um, and that didn't matter where I went. Mm -hmm. That was always met with that resistance. So when I went to DC, uh, naively, I assumed they would think that too, but they didn't. They said, oh, if you want to ink yourself, go right ahead. That would make our lives easier. We don't have to hunt someone down. Right. So, and Dead Man was the first thing to let me ink myself. So people always say, well, man, you went from doing these uh, licensed books and Micronauts and stuff, and then Dead Man. I go, well, it was always there. They just wouldn't let it happen. Yeah. So when I got to a place where they said, we'll let it happen, it was like a brand new guy. But that was how I always intended my stuff to look. Not that I was the greatest inker on myself, but I was heavy on the blacks, very big on texturing. Um, my storytelling, I wanted intentionally different than standard comics because I wanted people to stop and look right. and I wanted them to consider it. And I figured if all the information was there, but even if it's in my wonky way, uh, it'll work. I'm not big on the rules. Uh, I don't believe in the rules. I think the rules are great when you're trying to prove something to get in the door. And then once you get, it's like an actor. Can you ride a horse for this movie about knights? Yes, I can. And then you go that weekend and learn how to ride a horse. Right. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's what I would do. I'd tell them anything they wanted and then go in there and fake it. Yeah. I was going to say, inking your own stuff because your stuff is so distinct that you'd have to have, be working with someone whose vision aligns so much with yours to make it stand out the way you wanted it to stand out. Well, I, I always looked at it this way. Um, if I worked with an anchor or a writer or whoever, and I always did, um, they don't have to do anything different. They just do what they do. Write your story, ink the way you ink, color the way you want to color. I'll do what I do. Right. And, um, and comics are collaboration. So I don't mind if it doesn't look exactly how I would do it. I love John Betty's inking on me mm -hmm. because it wasn't how I would do it. And in some ways it brought out something brand new and wonderful. And I loved it. Yeah. And it became something really special. I would work with John in two seconds, any time, you know, awesome. if, if John wanted to, I would, because you get that other thing, you're dealing with another artist and, and, as a penciler, I don't go in there and say, well, it's my way or the highway. It's not that way. It's okay. I look at the guy, I see what he's about and I try to meet him halfway when, a, uh, and at that point, um, uh, I think a lot of inkers love a lot of ink, a mm. lot of solid inks. So, because I'm an inker too, I used to love that. Yeah. You like your drawing to work without color. You like your work to look like if they had to print my stuff in black and white, I would always feel good that it would still work. Oh, 100%. Um, so, but that's classic illustration. And so I, I would always try to do that. But for me, the primary thing was the ideas. Because mm -hmm. one idea catapults another idea, breeds more ideas. I'm not a technical guy. I started as a technic trying to do it. And then I realized it got in the way of what the possibilities were. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the great artists that invented comics, 
they all seem to do that too. You have 20 years of Jack Kirby doing everything right. Then he goes bonkers. <laughs> and it's like, that's where Steve Ditko, the same way, yeah. followed everything. Then he went and did his own thing. And it was like, bon and it was wonderful. Mm. So, um, so that's why Dead Man I made literally dead. Yeah. Um, Batman I made intimidating without being Captain America with a cape. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes memorable. That's not the reason I did it. Right. It, now I can only measure it because time has passed. I go, now I see, yes, it is memorable. Right. And I apologize to people for upsetting them so much because <laughs> I didn't see it at the time. I was just enjoying doing it coming up with my own thing, uh, feeling like I was going into undiscovered country and and not being bored. Yeah. Okay. And I figured, uh, because I remember someone at DC saying to me, um, one of the production people saying that they thought it was wonderful, but did they know what I was up, what I was doing? And I didn't know, I didn't know what that meant. And because I'm not, I love comics, but I'm not the comic book fan in that sense. I have everything, you know, all the Marvel stuff from 61 on, I have it all, read them all. But I was like a fan guy. I'm still a fan guy. Yeah. So I didn't look at it as a technical thing. Mm -hmm. I just remember the emotion of it. I remembered the solid joy of uh, Gene Colan doing Submariner or, uh, you know, I really loved uh, Wally Wood doing Doctor Doom comics and, and Amazing Adventures, whatever, um, or Astonishing Tales. So I would read those things, and that's what I loved. Mm -hmm. I never got into it knowing every detail, the issue, who did what, whatever. I just remembered that emotion. And so I wanted to give that emotion over as well. Mm -hmm. And so if that day I got a boring script page, I tried to make it not boring so I could get through the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sense, yeah. Yeah. And um, so when I got Batman, I realized uh, that was rare. Not many guys get, and in those days to be given to, to have to sign a contract to do it for as long as I did, hmm. that was, that was a, a real honor. So I respected DC for that decision. And at that point, if they're doing that, they're expecting you to come up with something yeah. and not just play it safe. Mm -hmm. And I had heard them talk about guys that they had signed that played it safe. And they were, it, it was all there, but I, you could hear their disappointment, right. you know? So I figured I will rather disappoint them with garish overblown crap <laughs> than by the number stuff. Right. And when, the filmmakers started being influenced what I was doing and the toy people and all that kind of stuff. Um, at that point, I knew, okay, I, I satisfied them because that's really what they wanted was an identity to the book beyond just the character itself. Mm -hmm. You know, the creative staff. I was lucky that Doug Minch was writing personal stories. I was lucky that Greg Wright and Todd Klein wanted to be there and devote themselves to, I, in fact, I told all the guys all the time, experiment, do whatever you want. If you want to come up, you know, I used to tell Todd, come up with anything you want. I tell Greg, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I am not sitting here saying, I want this to be me. If I wanted to be me, I would go, went, went off and done my own book right. by myself, you know, but comics are more, much more fun when you collaborate, yeah. much more fun. That whole thing that you're just saying about experiment, how big was the impact of working on the vertigo, vertigo line on that mindset of yours? Because vertigo to me, it always seemed like was about experimentation that. Well, I was there before it became vertigo. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that. I was, I was just doing it because when I came over to DC, I was ready to quit comics because I wasn't feeling uh, personally gratified by it. And the stuff, like I said about their late 60s, early 70s, those are the guys in my head I was competing with. Mm -hmm. um, not the guys currently, not that they were anything less. It's just in that period, you can tell each artist without just looking at the work. So when I got there, I figured um, I'm here now because I made the decision to be myself 
and that exploded on dead. Mm. And I had done a swamp thing fill in and it went through the roof and a grim Jack just yes. to try it. And it did the same thing. And then I did an aliens. So I kept doing these books and characters in as if I had invented in myself. Mm -hmm. So you go into it. It's a, it's a, it's a nifty trick. You have to be confident, not arrogant. You have to have the strength of enough ego to be able to take people not liking it. Not, yeah, I need love and tell me I'm great. To have them say, what the hell are these ears so long for? <laughs> but Marvel had taught me have an answer. Yeah. And mine was intimidation. You know, a shadow, a shape. Uh, I didn't see him standing around. I didn't see him having romance. I didn't see him anything like that. He was freaking from hell. Right. And things from hell don't have romance. They come to put you in your place. And if you don't do it, you don't know what they're going to do to you. But they have to look like that. Right. Um, so that's how I, I would think about it. Uh, I always think of comic book fans. We're the exception that stick around, hang around, deal with it. I was used to comic book fans coming in for four or five years and then growing up or moving on or doing something else. So for my time, I just wanted to be what they thought it was mm -hmm. through my own filter. And um, and when I got a thing like when I was doing stuff, because they became Vertigo later, but when I was there, they were just DC horror line, basically. It didn't have a name. Mm -hmm. So I would do Dead Man was just Dead Man. Um, Sandman had not become that. Yeah. Uh, none of these things... Uh, none of these things th now inside the company they said we don't mix like Swamp Thing won't be in Batman Okay. and the only reason it got to be when I ran it uh, on Batman was I had built relationships with the people who are now Vertigo and I said hey would it be cool if I could have Swamp Thing and they said yeah you did your service that would be great we trust you Right. Um, uh, so at that point when I asked for Dead Man Dead Man, they weren't sure. I always remember there was a Who Runs Dead Man. But since I had made my name with it, they go, well, we'll let you do it because we'll trust you. Right. Now, I don't know how they do that now because I think there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. But in those days, Danny O'Neill was the end all of Batman. Mm -hmm. And even with the movie companies, they would call him and say, is this okay? Is that, you know, he was right. the guy. Um, I miss that. Because mm -hmm. it should be the comic book guys. You know, and he had proved himself on probably the greatest run of Batman. He had proved himself as uh, an incredibly gifted writer. So, of course, they would trust him. Um, I don't think they do that now. I think now it's a lot of people who who are in charge have not produced the book. So so it's hard to, for them to know what an artist can do. Denny knew exactly what an artist should be able to do every month. Mm -hmm. Uh, Archie Goodwin, when I was with him, he knew exactly what what was reasonable. Um, they'd have fired everybody now if you couldn't get a book done in a month. Yeah, it's a whole different. And they would, and what they what they felt would happen, and I agree with this. Uh, and this isn't old timey. What they felt was the longer you spent with a character, the more magic may happen with you and that character. And I had that said to me all the time. Yeah. Uh, Denny was very proud that uh, he had Chuck and Graham, Alan and Norm, and me and Doug, and they were very all different books because we had spent so much time with the character, we all had our idea, and he felt that was a great way to sell the character. Everybody had their own real hard vision on it. No one was more correct than the other person. Um, and you could, everybody could read everybody else's book and not feel like, they didn't get it. Um, so that was that was a thing that was terrific. Uh, the 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 take on on for me when I came to Swamp Thing um, was the same thing. Was at that point, and probably because I was working with Len Wein at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but Len wanted to go back to straight horror, and he wanted tragedy again, and he wanted he wanted all these things. And uh, mind you, he was the guy who edited Alan Moore. Yeah. And he loved Alan Moore. He loved it. 
In his head, though, he saw it this way. And that was kind of the way DC was. You could have five different kind of interpretations of the same character. They weren't different. They weren't disparate. It was, it was all terrific. But it encouraged everybody's creativity. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to say, well, I have to bend a knee to this style or that thought. You just go and do it. But Dead Man, it just your take was so perfect for it because he he is a ghost. He's a rotting corpse in many ways, and yeah. that's you drew him how it, it. I think it should have been drawn, uh, but it's it, was there pushback to be like, wait, no, he's been this way for a while now. We can't. I I don't. I never met it. What happened at that time was, uh, I when I came over to DC, that was one of the first assignments I got. I was frustrated with my career because I had what was in my head. I couldn't get an inker mm -hmm. and I couldn't get, I couldn't get that kind of my kind of storytelling across without a lot of pushback. So when I came to it, a uh, perfect storm kind of happens. Mm -hmm. uh, my editor was Barbara Kiesel. She didn't really, I mean, it was a, a job given to her uh, for these little eight page things you know, eight page thing, what do you care? You're off, you know, I want to edit, she's editing Wonder Woman and everything. So that the real stuff. So, okay, fine, go do it. And if you showed any interest or inclination or, or initiative, fine. You know, it's very much like the mafia. If you can bring something in, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that I, I was earning. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> And so she would allow for that because it looked different to her. And I wasn't trying to do Neil Adams, which everybody was trying to do, and you just can't do it. Right. You simply cannot do it. It Neil Adams, Dick Giordano, game over. Right. Um, so you come in from a different way. And that was the only way to me was, well, how do, if I invented Dead Man, and I remember thinking that if I invented it and it came to my head, he's dead, he's a ghost, mm -hmm. why not look like it? Uh, he's not bound by our physical laws um that can make it interesting because really he's boring unless because when he's doing something he, he takes someone else's body over you don't see him do stuff so he has to be really awful and weird and bizarre so when he takes over someone you go oh that's disgusting um and i the only thing i ever used to tell everybody when i was uh, mike Barron was when he takes someone over it's got to be awful it can't be good. It can't, it's got to be awful for the person because you and I would go, I mean, if you're just sitting there, we're interviewing and all of a sudden it's four hours later, you would be kind of upset. <laughs> you wouldn't know why you'd go to every doctor in the world. You have MRIs, you can see psychiatrists. What happened? You know, did aliens get me? Right. So I said, it's got to be, it's got to be awful. And the last thing you do. And uh, so that's where the ideas come from. That's awesome. You know, the ideas come from, uh, for Batman, it came from this shape. I wanted this shape. Mm -hmm. And I and I told them, the bat signal is not a please come help us. It was a warning. He's loose. Right. And that's how it worked for me. And that way, when you sit down and draw in the day, even if no one else knows it, right. it adds a vibe to it. It's like feedback on a good guitar solo. Um, it's wrong. A producer should remove it. But once you've heard it, you can't go back to the clean, right? Uh, you know, and and I have nothing wrong with it, but the artists I really dug were kind of helter skelter, mm -hmm. and you and and you'd never forgot their stuff, right? And the clean guys all became grouped together to me and homogenized, even for all time. I, I they're terrific and I love them, and but I forget about it. They yeah. don't make they don't make that image. And the guys that I loved that were kind of scruffy made the images. Now there's exceptions. John Byrne was brilliant, mm -hmm. but John Byrne to me was such an independent idea guy who could draw commercially uh, as Neil Adams did. Mm -hmm. um, so you're brilliant. Um, but the guys who I really dug, for example, with Batman was Marshall Rogers, who was such his own guy. And I could say, what he did it for maybe just a less than a year it became his mm -hmm. and anyone who hasn't read it you're lucky because once you read it you're going to go oh my god um wrightson the same way with bernie wrightson did 10 issues of swamp thing career solidified mm -hmm. steranko 
what, 500 pages of art, uh, 400 pages of art, something like that. Yeah. Solidified because the ideas were so damn good mm -hmm. that they never left you. To this day, they never. Um, I heard once Storanko saying, well, you know, his anatomy was this and that. I'm going, no, it was perfect. Right. If he had drawn the way that he was perfect, it wouldn't have been Storanko. And I don't want the other guys. I want Storanko, you know? So you go into it with that high, with maybe not, I mean, reasonably, you're not going to hit that level. I, I didn't think I'd hit that level. But what I would do is go, I'm going to, I'm going to foster that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to go in, I'm going to go into it, you know, try to hit a triple. <laughs> I think you did more than that because with Batman, with the, the covers you did and what was going on in the books, there's, with your art, there was such an intensity. Yeah. And, and I, I, I hate to use the word, but there's a madness to it. Yeah, there it, is. There, there it, absolutely. What's going on with his, in his mind, what was going on in Gotham with everything going on. I think if you had a, a homogenized kind of cover of Batman, you know, oh, like, you know, from the 80s and not to knock that stuff like you and I said, yeah. Yeah. but it, it wouldn't have hit you as hard. It'd be like, oh, okay, Batman is going through this. I, I still think, well, part of it was I was lucky enough to work with Doug. Mm -hmm. So it lended itself. And I had an editor who said, go, fine, that's what you do. But when you're left alone like that mm -hmm. and there was no internet, there was no instant communication, there was no instant reaction, so I would draw something and I wouldn't know what anyone thought about it till five months later. Okay. And um, when I would draw, I was so happy that day that I wasn't bored. Right. The ideas were coming to fruition. The ideas didn't have to be explained. I would draw this menacing character who hated crime. Yeah. Who hated... It, it, not not in a social justice way of the reasons for it. You're doing it, stop it. You can control it. That's how I saw Batman. He didn't care about the rest. And that's what the fear came in. So I would always do it like going, yeah, he doesn't care if you were born this way or this thing happened to you or whatever. Don't do it anymore. Right. Or I might do something or I will do something. And that's how I drew him. So at that point, his physicality had to be more than just anatomy. Mm -hmm. And that's where the cape came in. Uh, I used to tell Doug, I ain't drawing him in daylight. So whatever he does is at night. Because it doesn't, that's half his power. Right. And so Doug used to always draw everything at night. And I go, hey, they can get away with it in the day, but they know the sun goes down like a vampire. They know the sun goes down. Right. It's a strange question, but in your mind during this, and I'm trying to jump into Batman's mind during this, has Bruce Wayne taken a back seat a bit to Batman, where Batman's more in control and Bruce Wayne is sort of it's always Bruce Wayne. It's always Bruce Wayne. Hundred percent Bruce Wayne. It's mm -hmm. not he's not psychologically confused or upset or whatever. That's his job. Yeah. And um he knows how to pass. Mm -hmm. Hey, I I'm a freaking comic book artist who has to go to the grocery store and deal with normal people all day long so i always got it you know it's like i go with my wife who's in the normal world to her christmas parties and i'd be very polite thinking all these crazy thoughts that you do that you're a comic book artist you know and if somebody knew you were a comic book artist or she would say something to that they would look at you as like oh my god that's so you know somebody does that or whatever yeah. so i always understood the secret identity part you know, mm -hmm. you go to the bank, you go to a restaurant, you go somewhere and you're, you're passing like everybody else. But then you go home and do this thing that maybe three or four hundred people in the country do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so and and you really have to suffer to get there. It isn't like they just give it to you. Mm -hmm. You have to get there to, and earn it and then stay there. Mm -hmm. So the secret identity thing was great. So when I would do Batman, I would always think of it like that. It's like, yeah, it's it's Bruce. Yeah, it's never been anything but Bruce. He puts on the cape because it isn't like who he really is. I know that's easy fodder for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but it's easy. It's too cheap. I the the it's Bruce, mm -hmm. and there's no trouble with it. Uh, I always thought Steve Englehart nailed it beautifully in that run with Marshall Rogers. Mm -hmm. 
where the whole time, you know, it's Bruce. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm conflicted. No, it's Bruce. And his frustration may be that something happens that he can't go deal with right at that moment. But when he deals with it, it's, it's, it's still Bruce, which makes it far more interesting to me. Do you think if this story had come out five years earlier, it would have been A, allowed by DC and B, uh, so, you know, loved by the fans? during a time when, you know, they were used to Batman from maybe the Super Friends who, you know, he would, you know, round up the Riddler. I think it, I think with most things in comics, the great things happen without, uh, without the intention of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve Englehart did not know Marshall Rogers was going to be his artist. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was retiring from comics for a while to go write novels in Spain. So he wrote, he finished out his contract, wrote these stories, turned them in. He did not know Marshall was going to get them. Marshall got Terry Austin and Jerry Serpa to work on it, Ben Oda to letter it, all, all great people. Mm -hmm. So it was a weird, here, just let's get these done and then we'll move on to what we really do. What happened was it, it took a life of its own. And um, I was very fortunate as a kid to have been at a convention where Marshall and Steve met each other for the first time after those books had come out. Wow. And Engelhart saying, gave me a huge hug saying, you, I couldn't, I didn't even see how good this could be. You know, I had no idea that it would, could be this. I think it's virtuous. It's short and to the point. Mm -hmm. Um, DC at that time did not care for those books, yeah. even with the success. Um, and that's why Marshall went over to Marvel. Mm -hmm. But Marshall wasn't hurt, hurt by that. He knew when you know you've hit a home run, when you know you've gotten that touchdown pass and you didn't do what the coach said, fine. Because we still remember it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was completely fine with it. He knew what he got. And and I I can I can relate to that feeling that once you can get something out to the fans and they respond to it, mm -hmm. um, no matter what you hear, anything, all those sacrifices are well worth it. Uh, and on a personal level, when these books are coming out, the world knows this is happening. It becomes news that A, Batman's going to have his back broken. Yep. There's going to be another Batman. Yep. So it's not just comic fans. It's people... You know, there's curiosity, like, oh, I've known Batman for years. What are they going to do? Yeah. Are you feeling any pressure being the man whose art is going to be on the cover of these books that this is hitting a, a big, big uh, swath of people? I might have been if I was doing the interiors, but I was off doing Red Rain. Right. And I was doing Red Rain and uh, I was doing Venom for Marvel. So I had other things going on and I was just the cover artist thing was what I would do for a couple days a month for detective and Batman. And I knew Doug well, because I'm doing red rain with him. And um, at that point I would go into it almost bothered because it would take me out of my rhythm of the other books I was doing. Yeah. And they did not know exactly what they wanted because the books were being written in advance. It was three or four writers working on it with the editors. Kind of, so a lot of times they would call me and say, we don't know who's gonna be in it, but we know this kind of thing happens. So where it was, where I would be distracted for that time, at least the pleasure, even though the deadlines were like sometimes, uh, it would be you have several hours to pencil and ink it. That that's it. It's it's got to be out so we can get it to the printer because they would be running that late. Yeah. They, that they didn't miss a deadline was amazing, and it wasn't going to be because of me right. that a cover wasn't in. So I had a lot of freedom, and that's where a lot of the power of those covers comes in is that they just said this happens, or we think this goes on, or this guy might be in it. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I just would go to town. That's and right. um, and I think that kind of organic fear, mm -hmm. uh, simply to make a FedEx deadline, 
because there was no scanning then. You had to put it in a box and ship it back east. Yeah. Um, really added to that zeitgeist of that whole thing. Makes sense. I, I prefer I prefer fear and and tight deadlines to lots of planning and y'all figure it out because um, that's what you know and that's what they expected from us all. Mm -hmm. They just said you got to be able to produce. I, I, I think comics lacks that now. It doesn't have that uh, bang, here it is. Um, a cover shouldn't take two weeks. A cover shouldn't take forever. Uh, frankly, cover shouldn't be painted. It should be whoever's drawing the book, you do the cover. Mm -hmm. Even when I was doing that, I always said, well, can't you get the guys to do their own? Uh, because I was always so disappointed you know, myself when I was a collector that they didn't match up, but that's not how it worked, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but still in all, it should have that real power yeah. of, 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 and it should still be comic. Mm -hmm. You know, it should have that graphic feel. 100%. I want to jump into Red Rain in a second, but I, I just want to take a sidestep because you told that great story about Engelhart yeah. um, at the convention. And this is something that we've kind of learned during the show. Like growing up, I always thought, okay, the writer... And the, and the artists sat next to each other and they talk about this back and forth. And that's how the books would get done. Mm -hmm. And from talking to people, there's some folks who never spoke to the writer. They would get it. They never met the person. They never have I don't understand that. But was, was that your experience? At My Super experience was we would always talk it over. Okay. Uh, uh, when working with Doug Minch, he would talk it over. I think the... Uh, uh, and if you didn't, like with Mike Barron on Dead Man, he had seen what I drew. He'd asked a few things of what I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, rather than say scenes, I said tone. Right. And we would go from there. But he would leave it wide open, very organic for me to come up with my own stuff. Uh, when I worked with uh, Neil on Sandman, the first two scripts I did, which was Calliope and... Dream of a Thousand Cats had been written. Mm -hmm. When I did when I did Seasons of Mist, that was us on the phone discussing each issue, how it was going to go. But that was because he was up against it deadline wise. Okay. And so we would go back and forth. And I think the reason those books really stand out is they're created in the traditional way of comics, right. where right. the artist is saying this and the art writer saying that. And, and even up until I'm actually drawing it, that's going on. Mm -hmm. He would call me and say, hey, panel seven on this, let's change it to this. Or I would call him and say, I don't think the gates of hell should look like this. They should look, what do you think? And we go back and forth. That's a, totally exciting. And if it's exciting for us, it's exciting on the page. Um, and so, so I had that kind of experience. Even up to uh, what I'm doing now, uh, uh, you know, it's like... Uh, Kings of Fear with Scott Peterson. It was that way. We were talking about it as I was drawing it. Len Wein with Swamp Thing. It was that way while I was doing it. Uh, the Lobo stuff I was doing. It was that way while I was doing it. It was all right, very immediate. But I'm not saying I insist on it, but I want to get the writer what he intends on paper. Right. And I think sometimes they worry too much about what a artist, you know, they, they shouldn't. You just... I'll take more work or I'll take whatever to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But I think that collaboration is what's so, if you have any chance of a special book, that's how it happens. I would say, and that's why I think your career is so incredible because so many books you've done are special books. And it seems like it's because there's that rapport with the writer that. I appreciate that. And I think that's exactly what it is. Yeah. I know that, I know that, um, Again, when I was coming up and reading these things uh, before I even had a job, that's all I ever heard. You read an old Foom magazine, the, they get together and they go have dinner and lunch. When I went to DC the first times and met everybody, they would all go to lunch at these great diners in downtown New York, downtown uh, Manhattan, up, you know, <laughs> and um, and that's where I would hear them all talk about what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, they're eating pastrami sandwiches the way they should. 
And they're all discussing how they're going to do this. Afterwards, they'd go get a drink before they called it quits and they would still be doing this. So it was collaboration all the way from writers to editors, editors to editors, productions to everybody was talking about it. No one was saying this is how it's going to be in stone. Right. Um, uh, the rules we had were so minor that they were great. Uh, Danny O'Neill, the one I can remember offhand was no traffic jams in Gotham. So Batman could get somewhere. Uh, that I dug. I went, okay. Um, uh, so at that point, th but that was about it. The rest was, he, you know, he is his rule used to be to all the other guys as well as me. Uh, you do what you do. I'll sell the comic book. That's my job. Your job isn't to sell it. Your job is to get it to me on time. Right. As you see it and mm -hmm. I'll sell it. I was so, uh, I think I'm the last guy who had a reasonably long run. I did three years. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, but nobody thought that was a long run then. <laughs> you know, it's like three years, that's what you should do. I was to do a fourth year, but then they wanted to link all the books. And, and kind of what the charm I had with Doug was we were off on our own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at that point, I think it would have changed it so much that it wouldn't have been us anymore it would have been like uh you know that last season of a tv show that you just go no and i didn't want to ever do that last season of it i didn't want my third season of star trek i wanted my first two seasons i wanted my first two episodes you know star wars empire strikes back i didn't want to do return of the jedi <laughs> oh don't break my heart so <laughs> i know <laughs> so, so i just figured i'll end with empire strikes back and that's it and uh and that was fine they were they were cool with it Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I was, I was lucky enough that those were, those books stood, you know, it's long enough now to where I can go. Yeah. I don't, I'm not embarrassed by any, you know, cause I, I don't, I'm not a guy who rereads my stuff and looks at it. So some years later when they said, we're going to reprint them, it had been almost 20 years. And I went back and looked at them to see if I was going to wince and be upset and whatever, but but because my eyes had rested, the heat was off, I could just read them as, as for pleasure mm -hmm. and not see all the nuts and bolts and crap. I went, man, that was good. Doug, I'll give it to Doug. He gave me everything I needed. John did everything. I was supported by great people. I always felt I was the weakest link on that because Doug <laughs> had many years. John had been on everything great and inked everybody who was great. Um, Todd is Todd. Uh, Greg was Greg. They were all people who had long histories of great work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I felt I had a pretty good net under me. But when I looked at them, I went, these are good, you know? Um, and I'm not good with that. I'm not good with saying that. <laughs> but I had 20, 15, 20 years separation from it. Right. And I could look at everything else that had been, you know, and I went, okay, I, I realized we were, we did something, uh, Danny O'Neill once told me he thought something special had happened, but I, you don't know what that means um, because he didn't go in and say, you're better than this or you're worse than this. He just said something special had happened. Special can be bad. You know, um, <laughs> you're, you're very special, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so, but when he said that, um, I filed it away. And then sometime later I realized uh, he did come up to me maybe a couple of years before he passed. And he did say to me that um, he had felt something really, that was a really good little run. And um, it felt it felt really classic to him in a, like we were doing uh, the forties or something in that time. And, and I appreciated that. I give all the credit to Doug because Doug really set the tone with those scripts. Mm -hmm. And, um, allowed me a great amount of latitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know he rolled his eyes a number of times with, you know, these capes that would go on and stuff, <laughs> but he never said, stop doing it, right. you know? Just a quick question about uh, Sandman was that, did you realize that, that when you were, you know, working on it, looking at it, did you think this is a book that would last the test of time? Yeah. You did, and do you think DC knew what they had on their hands at the time? I think I think DC. Some people might have then. Okay. 
But I, I think what DC thought at that time was that they had this pretty strong cult book that was getting uh, at the cocktail parties, they were all hearing great stuff, but they don't get out in the world the way I was. You know, I'd go out and see what was happening at the uh, record store where they would sell comics. And I would see people who weren't into comics buy, you know, it went from major cult book to I think uh, Dream Country, it started to do better. The cat issue is the one that exploded. Mm. And I think that one, because it's the single greatest issue of Sandman written. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have Sandman in it. Right. It's in a complete experiment in how to do a comic without your character, but it's it's pure, it is the most pure Sandman issue mm -hmm. um, because you see what it really means. If all the cats agree on something and they never do, but if they do, he'll change the universe um where they're in charge mm -hmm. but he had to come up with different adjectives he can't say you know how we would speak but how a cat would think it was a lot of cool stuff going on in one issue yeah. and in one issue you can hand it to your friends and say read this and they don't feel goofy because there's a guy in a, a costume doing stuff <laughs> so i remember i remember calling neil and i said hey uh just my what I see is up to this point, you could always find issues of the Sandman uh, on the Tower Records rack. You mm -hmm. could find back issues from the cat issue on. You can't find it anymore. Wow. And then when I got seasons, it was selling like X-Men. Then OK. Did he realize th that that was a, a turning point or did he it... was in England, so he didn't know. Yeah, it's a whole different world. Yeah, he was in England, and so he would call me and say, how's it going? And I said, well, I was doing some, uh, I had friends who uh, worked for a comic book store chain. Uh, Bud Plant had a, uh, the distributor had several stores called Comics and Comics. So I had a lot of friends there, and they would tell me, hey, this is doing great. This is really doing well. And it's, that's how I knew. And I said, well, I went to a Tower Books and the cat issue was gone. And the guy there who didn't know who I was said, man, all the everything they had was gone at that point. And uh, and then tried to sell me on buying Sandman. And I did never said who I was. <laughs> so um, uh, and I, oh, yeah, that's a good. OK, I'll give it a shot. I'll see what it is if it's any good. Um, but at that point. Neil would call and say, well, how's it doing there? Because there was not the media and there wasn't the instant knowledge. It, it, would just, it was all anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, I went down to San Francisco. You can't find one. And when I did a signing, there's lines out the door for this thing. I said, it's the same as when I'm doing Batman. Yeah. I said, I do Batman, Red Rain, line out the door. I do this, line out the door. That isn't happening for the other guys because these books are happening. So I would tell DC all the time, um, I think I think this this is happening. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it were me, I would put more ads in books. Yeah. You know, I would just say, or get some reaction and stuff. Neil took it upon himself and, went, and uh, went and got, you know, Norman Mailer and Michael Gilmore and all these people to write which DC had told him not to do. <laughs> wow. But since he was a journalist, he knew all these people and he went and said, no, I'm going to do it and did it himself. Yeah. And then of course they took those quotes and, and rest is history. But you know, when, when you make a comic book and it gets outside of our, the it, look, the fan world was much bigger than it is now. The movies make it think there is, but it's not. Uh, when I was doing it, there'd be 800 people online, half of them 12 years old. And they were buying everything too. You don't see that now. And what they do is they, the movies give this illusion or the television shows give the illusion. And it's not true. Right. But it was then. And so when you had Nightfall or you had Seasons of Mist. I was very, I, I did have this thing where I would go from book to book to book and they seemed to be hits. Right. But they were all eccentric. Red Rain was eccentric. Dead Man was eccentric. S Sandman was very eccentric. My take on Batman was eccentric. Mm -hmm. 
And the comics kind of fed on that. And I took great pleasure in not looking like Image or Marvel at that time because that was kind of what was taking over in, in that sense. Not that it wasn't good, but it was just, well, if I'm going to, I felt better about the success of those books because they weren't uh, disco. Exactly. You know, we were doing our own thing. Um, not that that means it's bad. I love them too. But, and I'm a Saturday night fever guy. So <laughs> I love the Bee Gees, but I'm just saying it wasn't this one big monolithic way of thinking that it had happened. So we would be there, it would be all these kind of the way people, everyone does it and us. And I appreciated that. And I always felt, okay, I know we'll make it. Yeah. I know we'll make it. Um, and I always thanked all my old influences of Wrightson and Plug and Frazetta and all those guys. Uh, Wally Wood. Uh, I was very much into Don Heck and all these old guys. Uh, not because they were old, but they knew how to freaking draw. And... I felt like, okay, I'm still doing that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing it through my lens and whatnot, and I'm getting great scripts, but probably that's why a lot of those writers gravitated to me because they could understand it. By the way, I totally agree with Mike Plug. That's somebody whose name should be everywhere. Uh, <laughs> it should really be everywhere. It's yeah, everywhere. And, and, you know, my feeling with my feeling with Plug or those guys, well, he and Wrightson, Tom Sutton, then too, um, Alex Nino, they were all in these old horror books. And uh, that's where I would see something just stunning, just high level illustration in, in something that was just a comic book, not putting any of the other guys down. It was just, wow, that's different didn't mean better. It just meant different. And comics, when I was coming up, really, really pushed, hey, different is good. Um, and come up with your own way of doing it. So Plug just made stuff up as he went. Right. You know, but Plug was a get things done guy. Mm -hmm. But he knew how to, you know, Eisner taught him. Mm -hmm. He knew how to invent with his head. Um, I think his his monster of Frankenstein was stunning yeah. uh, and unfortunately forgotten when it shouldn't be uh, because then he goes on to Werewolf by Night and Ghost Rider and stuff like that and they're genius. Yeah. You know, but I always, that's where I discovered him was monster of Frankenstein. And I just thought this is, this is stunning art. Mm -hmm. Even as a kid, he and Wrightson were, uh, brilliant in their placement of light their composition all these things stuff you don't think of as a kid you just react to it you know good is good mm -hmm. later on when you learn the nuts and bolts then you see what they did mm -hmm. but at that time i'm reacting to it you know so then speaking of Hari, you get you get the jump into red rain dracula batman and i have a super nerdy question um but when you're drawing dracula just because you're uh, you're a horror guy i'm a horror guy are there parameters as to how Dracula can look that you were given? Because I know it's there's different Draculas and there's different ownership of certain facial features. Yeah, I think uh, the only thing I remember was they said um, they wanted him kind of uh, erudite and aristocratic and handsome and like he would look at on going to Gotham so I should look like I fit in. And that's all they said. However you do that, you do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I, when I first read, I said, oh man, I love the big mustache and the big hair. And they said, no, 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 no. <laughs> he's obviously looking at going to Gotham. So he should look like he could blend in. Mm -hmm. uh, his goal is to take over Gotham in this apocalyptic way. And I went, okay. So if he walked down the street, you just think he's a really good looking actor who has a lot of money kind of guy. And then, all right, I, that's cool. Um, uh, and I wasn't disappointed by it because it is in Gotham. And, and to be fair, uh, when someone just calls you and said Batman versus Dracula, I was not thrilled by that idea. I just went, ah. no, I, I didn't see it. 
I was wanting the Joker or the Penguin or the Scarecrow or those kind of guys. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they said Dracula and I read the, the treatment, um, well, it was when I read the treatment, I thought it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And then they left it totally open to me how I would draw Batman being affected by this. Right. Um, and it was pure joy at that point. I think Red Rain has lasted as long as it has is because the sheer force of the idea. And it pays off. The book pays off as a true gothic story, not a horror story. It is gothic. Right. How important was that for you to be on the project and to get a script that you could really enjoy, that you could follow as a fan? Uh, it's what you wait for yeah. your whole career. You wait for, for you know, I had... You always you always think, well, if this is the last thing I do. And when I did Dead Man, I thought, well, this is great. Mm -hmm. I got Dead Man. I got to do what I wanted. If it all ends, they'll know what I all they'll know what I was thinking, what I was going to be. The next thing, essentially, the next thing I get that I have to devote myself to is Red Rain, mm -hmm. and uh, where you're alone in a garret drawing for, you know, eight months. And no one's going to know what you're up to. And they're going to say, did you quit? Where are you? That whole thing. So when you come out of it, the only problem with it was I was slated to come out the same weekend, same week as uh, the incredible Simon Bisley's Batman Judge Dredd, which I could have strangled the people at DC over because they were going to step on me all the way. Here I am spending all my life on this thing. Yeah. And all I hear is how great Simon is. And it is. And they say, oh, by the way, it's coming out the same weekend. I went, well, there go my sales. There goes everything, all the airs out of the room. Right. Um, but we sold out that day. And uh, that was about 30 some odd thousand copies of a hardcover. Yeah. And when I had to go on signings, they had no, they had none for me to sign. Uh, it was all gone. So, and it was worth it because when I met Simon, he punched me in the arm really good. And that was great. <laughs> 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 So, uh, uh, but it was one of those tremendous moments mm -hmm. where you, as the creator of this thing or the, the artist on or whatever, can't see it. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I could not see what that meant. Right. And, um, and, I, and I've always been very fortunate in that regard that as Elseworlds go, it it stayed, even when they got rid of that whole thing, they kept it and right. they keep, they keep vampire Batman around. Um, and vampire Ma Batman, uh, it was funny because I have always felt that if I hadn't done that and then went on to Batman, um, I really would have shocked people, but they already saw vampire Batman. They said, Oh, he scaled it down a little bit, you know? <laughs> um, uh, because Vampire Batman was, I had done that in Bloodstorm before I went to do the monthly. Okay. So by that time, I had had these incredibly brutal books. Uh, even by today's standards, I look back and go, "How did they approve some of the image?" I mean, I just drew it, thinking, "Yeah, they'll do. They'll. They won't have a problem." You know, right. I didn't even think they'll have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. Now I look and I go, "I would think twice about some of this." You know, but maybe that was the time. It's like the. 70s movies as uh, compared to now you go wow how this was a g-rated film <laughs> you know plus when you look now those books sort of open so many doors for yep. uh where stories can go and and you know if you don't have to follow the same path there's all these different directions you can go that's because you guys sort of set the tone with those well doug was really into the old horror films like i was mm -hmm. So I used to always say to him, you know, when Hammer Films came out with Dracula, it's it's hard for people to figure it now, but things were so staid and still and whatever. And then you see color and blood mm -hmm. and complete action from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what he did right. was he came in there with that and said, well, that's what we're going to do is, is this complete Grand Gingle bloodletting yeah and and uh but batman has to you get two things batman you know doing what he does but having to retain who he is and doug always was right he says that's 
where we see that Bruce is still Batman. Mm -hmm. Not Batman is Bruce, Bruce is Batman. And it's that soul that we we're, we're he's fighting for his own soul as he's trying to save Gotham. And that was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the relationship with Alfred and with Gordon mm -hmm. was brilliant. Um, so there's, there's so much more power in those stories. And as time goes on, I think they've, they've worn well as well, because, uh, because they're played as Gothic stories, not horror stories. There's a lot of pathos, a lot of tragedy in them and mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Do you ever sit back now and think about all the people you got to work with? And it's sort of like, wow, you know, I. Yeah, because 12 year old Kelly never saw that. 12 year old <laughs> Kelly just sat there going, wow, Doug Minch is master of Kung Fu, Len Wein's uh, Swamp Thing. Uh, all these guys, Mike Barron and Neil Gaiman and all these guys uh, are luminaries within comics, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Steve Siegel big hero six and i did crusades with a couple of years a, a really terrific book right. and um so i i sit there and i go man i have been incredibly fortunate to work with not just great people but great people who were making their names on things so when somebody asks you to be on it at that time uh yeah it it's it's probably because i was naive i could do it mm -hmm. then now I would freeze and fall apart. But at that time, it was like, what's the next gig, people? Right. You know, and and I was coming out of like a six years of good training at Marvel, but not getting to be who I was to where people were asking you to be who you were. Yeah. And then right now, people are asking you as well. I would imagine that yeah. if they want to put something and they know it's going to make an impact and yeah. it's going to fit with their writing, this is the guy they want to go to. Yeah, and and what's kind of good, uh, a lot of people always say, well, they don't want to be stereotyped or pigeonholed. I love it because they know exactly what they're going to get. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, they know that uh, you're coming into this thing and you're going to, like I said, I'm an idea guy. I don't come in there and say, you're going to get this, however comics are done technically, mm -hmm. you're going to get something uh, through my vision that will be unique. Um, I don't sit out there to be different. I can't help it is what I mean. Right. It will it will just happen. Um, the, the the thing with Batman's cape mm -hmm. just took over. Right. I didn't say that when I started, but it just took over. Um, so when those moments happen, you go with it and ideas come from that. So it isn't just, oh, the cape's funky all the time. Yeah. Then it bleeds into other things. Right. Uh, down to the city becomes a character. You know, Gotham became as much a character as Gordon, Alfred, Batman. Yeah. Um, and that's the wonderfulness of comics is you let that happen. It isn't, I get the credit. It's that the medium allows you to do this. Mm -hmm. Whereas no other medium does. Film doesn't, uh, television doesn't. You, it, it's such a, I mean, you're by yourself doing it all day. You're by yourself all the time. Uh, the only time you ever see the reaction, because when people see it, it isn't like you go to a theater and sit with everyone. I mean, they're by themselves reading it. Right. So, it. <laughs> so, so all you hear, all you get is later on that reaction. Right. And what happens too, is you begin to realize that the excitement that you have when you're reading comics through life, if you've been able to do books that have that, that means those books influence on you have, have lasted because I'm just as exciting reading a 1965 Spider-Man by Ditko and Lee, you know, I, I, as much Thor mm -hmm. by Kirby and Coletta kills me every time, just kills me. I look at it and go, this could come out now and knock everything off the charts. It is not dated at all. Steranko writes mm -hmm. Adams any of these guys, their stuff still stands. If you never saw it and it was just coming out now, knock you out. And so you want to be somewhat at least in that same stream. Mm -hmm. So if Red Rain did or Sandman did, Dead Man did, Swamp Thing, any of those things did, I'm more than grateful. Is I want to be mindful of your time, but one last question is, is there a book that you wish you would A, 
been given a shot at or B had a longer run with? If I had a, and this is going to sound funny. It's between two. I always wanted a shot at Dr. Strange. Okay. And I always, and this, you're going to laugh, but I always wanted a shot at Superman. I didn't see that. Okay. And, and, and I had a different view of Superman and it came close twice, but then, you know, power shifts happen and the new people come in there and they go, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, uh, so those, and I would have loved to have done the final year of the, of Batman was intended. We had it planned out. And that was with this odd character, the marionette man, this mm -hmm. puppeteer guy you see in the background. The whole last year was to be that character. Okay. And not like every issue was, you'd have the other rogues gallery in it, but you would realize that he's not just pulling the strings on Batman, he's doing it to them too. And he's bringing it all together. And that was going to be my, okay, I've done four, ish, four years, I'm done. That that had all been planned. And, um, and again, it would have been floated just a few years ago, DC had said, maybe you should do a year long thing, you and Doug, and do that. Uh, and finish it and it would be that we'll get all the same crew together and do that but then things yeah. changed you know yeah so oh yeah yeah that seems to be the case now like you said before there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen a lot of cooks and a lot of them have never cooked yeah that's a lot of frustration i hear from people that they're yeah. getting feedback from folks who have no background in comics know nothing of comics well i would be fine if the books <clears throat> sold millions then i'd go okay Right. Danny O'Neill said, let's do this thing. And they sold millions of copies of Batman. Mm -hmm. I mean, it went from whatever to a million plus copies. And you go, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Right. Uh, but you got to sell the books then for me to, 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 okay. And I do think people, uh, I think fans aren't ashamed to be fans of and read comics. I think sometimes the creators are ashamed that they're making comic books. And I think that's the only thing I can figure right. is you're bringing people in there who are like kind of embarrassed. I, I make comic books, all right? I, I'm writing a comic, you know, a lot because they're bringing people from outside, which is fine, but there's this thing there mm -hmm. and I revel and roll in it like a dog in grass. All of the tropes of comics, all of the things, use it all. I want big sound effects. I want cliffhanger endings i want subplots and i want all of it and uh and i want the payoffs and i want one shot issues and i want all this crossover uh, good stuff like that the stuff that gets your blood pumping mm -hmm. i want an artist to do 12 issues a year for me if i'm just reading them right. pick a guy or the other guys can do annuals who can't do it just get them to do annuals or graphic novels but find guys who can do a monthly mm -hmm. and let's see what we get again. Yeah. Uh, it, look, no shit. It no more. It kills you. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I did three years in Rockaway prison, but I did it. You know? right. you yeah. <laughs> and, and I can remember the faces of people when I'd say I can only spend half a Christmas day. Cause I got to get back to it. Cause there's, you know, right. um, and that's just the way it is. That was everyone else. Uh, there's something magical when you make this stuff, when you brew that pot of coffee on Thanksgiving night, cause you got to get it done. Right. There's the magic to it. Yeah. Uh, your friends coming over, putting in a movie and eating pizza while you work. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, you're missing on a certain amount of life, but you know, the Beatles missed out a lot too, be making the white album. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so it isn't like I'm wasting my time, uh, being a dairy guy, no offense to dairy guys. I love them, <laughs> but, but you're doing something cool that you've spent your life to do and it's creative. So I used to never mind that. I'd hear guys, Oh, I, I, I missed a holiday or I couldn't do it. This is what, that's why they make coffee makers. Right. You know, I, put on your favorite record and enjoy it. And I think that's why you guys with that mentality, um, from that generation named your work, you are revered, remembered, 20 years after a book comes out oh, it's, I, that. And it's because I, that that love is in the work i knock on wood but i agree with you i mean i was contacted the other day that they want to do a big 
slipcase edition of my best stuff in a big book from DC. And I'm like going, and they want me to help pick out some of those, what I think they are. Yeah. Um, now I know that doesn't happen. I, I know it comes from being a stylist. It doesn't come from the care. It, it has to be together. The character, a style, it works. Right. And, and uh, if someone good or bad cannot tell it's you, mm -hmm. you're an illustrator then. A comic book artist, you know who it is. Mm -hmm. I knew John Buscema. I knew Gene Colan. I knew Kurt Swan. I knew him when I saw him. Yeah. They didn't, I didn't have to see their logo. I didn't even have to see the, I knew who it was. That's comics. Yeah. That's, that's, that's blood pumping comics. But when I look at guys, sadly it's now, I can't tell who they are mm -hmm. because they're all doing the same thing. And they're not getting those. And if you're not going to spend 12 months doing a book, you're not going to get the juicy thing that happens. It's just the way it is. It's hard work. And how do you tell someone you got to do hard work? They think they're doing, they are doing hard work, but spending 16 hours a day on a page that looks like everybody else's isn't what, they, right. you know, I would rather you do four or five hours and look like you. And that's what makes, like you said, that's what separates you from every other artist. That's well, look, some of the greatest artists I knew could, could do that. Mm -hmm. Marshall Rogers could do a page and a half a day. Mike Golden, two pages a day. They were doing pages a day. And they're geniuses. Yeah. John Byrne did the X-Men, the Avengers every month for a year. And he threw in a Hulk annual in 1978. So you got two group books that were as good as it ever had looked. Mm -hmm. And he threw in a Hulk annual. Right. I, that I would shoot myself. But I mean, that, <laughs> that's a genius. Two weeks to draw an issue of the X-Men during their classic period, two weeks to draw the Avengers during a classic period, mm -hmm. and then a Hulk annual with Bob Late. Right. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> and it's stuff that stands the test of time. It's, right, it's still, it's still, it's still as good as those books have ever been. Oh, yeah. Was that was that? Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, uh you don't always want to measure to someone like that, right. but that's what you aspire to exactly. is, okay, I can't do that much work, but maybe I can do one book a month, mm -hmm. you know, and then I'm still not doing, but I, uh, and Byrne did it because he had heard or knew Kirby's output. So he, he raised the bar on himself, right. you know, uh, Wrightson, um, they invented a whole genre of the monster book for him, the monster hero for him that had never been done. And he rose to the occasion because we still have those characters now. We still, that idea is still done. But that was a lot of work. You look at his style and he's all by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no inker for Bernie Wrightson. Right. You know, so he penciled, inked, and colored a book within two months and that's stunning yeah he's basically self-publishing yeah and dc was right there to do the heavy lifting for him so he does 10 issues mm -hmm. uh if he never did anything ever again it's the gold standard 100 percent. yeah and so that's because they came from that environment of you could be very artsy but you got to be blue collar too mm -hmm. and they've and that's kind of missed i i don't uh it's not that i don't respect it's just there's illustrators now and there's comic book artists and i think there's fewer comic book artists now than ever very few which is unfortunate yeah for the you know generations coming up now but thankfully you know they can look back at what I consider the golden age of yeah, what the comics were when it was. I think when you look at uh, when you look at the 60s, 70s of comic, uh, just how how much output there was, but the level of talent mm -hmm. there was, and it's all coming uh, from their heads, right? And they're all making deadline. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> there was no reference material. This is all. No, no I mean, <laughs> I, I can remember I would get a script and I would go to uh, go downtown. Uh, I give myself one day. I'd write down all the things that I thought I might need mm -hmm. and go to these old bookstores and try to find reference, some old books. I have a house filled with freaking books now. <laughs> But, you know, trains and tomb sculpture and uh, houses built in the South in 1850. I mean, stuff that a writer would throw at you and you have to go find this stuff. And luckily, there was a lot of old bookstores in those days. There aren't now, but there were. And I would go down and, you know, you, you knew you were going to spend uh, 50, 100 bucks a month on your reference material. Mm -hmm. Um that would only scratch the surface though of what so the rest had to come from your head right but also that's that's dedication and that's attention to detail yeah to look for those references to make sure it's accurate when you put in there just as much as you can as right. much as you can sometimes you just had to fake it because you couldn't find something right and then you call the writer and say look i apologize and they say look i apologize i i sometimes uh 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 neil wanted something once and he sent me a book um Doug used to send me little stats of things that he knew would be maybe difficult. I still would go downtown um, and go to these old bookstores uh, and try to find what I could. Uh, like I said, something like a train. You know, when I was doing, and, and some would be on myself, uh, when I was doing Batman, I didn't want to do modern exclusively so i'd have steam trains in gotham right next to modern computers right next to a hook and ladder phone but i wanted it uh anachronistic mm -hmm. um and not date itself that way i wanted it to be an eccentric place uh a place that looks like it would create maniacs and um and so that would work that would be kind of fun but 95 percent had to come from yourself and it had to be like how you remembered something like, oh, that was in a movie. If I can remember it, I'll, I'll do that. Um, but that's where style comes from. Where can folks find you now and get in touch with you or follow, look at your work? Pretty much uh, Facebook is, is where I, I mean, because you can get lost into social media to where all you do is social media. <laughs> uh, but I'm... Uh, you know, and there I'll answer questions and I'll show people. I mean, right now I'm involved in a pretty heavy project with Mike or with uh, Matt Wagner. Oh. Um, uh, and once we get that all squared away, I'll be able to talk about that. But I'm doing I'm doing a lot of different things. I, I just finished a short He-Man story just for fun. Um, uh, but it was horror, right? So a horror He-Man story would be great. Uh, I have a couple things that are in the pipeline with DC and, and uh, whatnot. So, but primarily uh, what I do now is look for things that I feel I can bring my own, that I still can do that thing that they asked me to do 30 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. just keep doing that because that's where the freshness is. That's mm -hmm. where uh, you don't repeat yourself. You're not, uh, uh, you're moving forward. I, I don't move forward the way the rest of the world does, but I move forward for myself, you know? Right. Well, that's what you got to do. You gotta live yeah. Oh yeah. I don't really care. I think the modern world gets it wrong a lot of times. So I'll still keep doing my own thing. I always wish there's certain, you know, uh, I'll look at a David Lynch or a Stanley Kubrick film and I go, yeah, to their own drummer. And that's why they're not dated stuff. I mean, you still watch it and you go, whoa, that, could have just come out and they obviously were influenced by earlier stuff but that orson welles was the same way and i would look at these guys and um it's, that's how you do it mm -hmm. if you want to stay relevant that's how you do it all right welcome back everyone uh, i hope you all enjoyed our interview actually oren's interview with kelly jones uh this is another solo home run by oren uh in, in full disclosure I didn't really know too much about Kelly Jones prior to this interview. I was familiar with the artwork, didn't really know who did it. Um, but then after listening to it and kind of going through my collection again, I realized, you know, how much he actually did I have a new appreciation for his work. So Oren, great job. 
totally agree. Um, great job, Oren. Uh, great job, Kelly Jones, for the career you've had. Uh, really redefined, you know, uh, the look of Batman and so many other characters. And excited for, you know, where we see Mr. Jones pop up next. But until such time, and until next time, uh, you've been listening to the Dollar Bin Bandits, and we will see you next time. Yeah.